The Secret of Kelly's Mill by Zena Karas Read by Nigel Greaves Chapter 1 Dead Fish Paul flopped down on the soft turf by the stream, out of breath but happy. He had cycled three miles home from school, grabbed his fishing rod, dodged his grandfather and dashed out to his favourite spot under the big willow tree, all in less than thirty minutes. This was better than tidying up the back garden. He sat up, took his fishing rod and fastened a bright green float to the thin line. He baited the hook and dropped it gently into a likely-looking pool in the middle of the stream. Then he propped the rod safely between two rocks, leaned back against the comfortably sloping tree and closed his eyes. There'd be trouble about the garden when he got home, but he'd think about that later. Paul liked this spot under the trees by Forge Mill Stream. It was a good place to sit and think and do some fishing, away from the tourists in the nearby village Port Santon. Suddenly there was a crashing amongst the thick bushes and tangled brambles close by, and someone shouted, Hi! Paul recognised the voice of his friend Midge. Hi! he called back. A skinny boy wriggled into view through the leaves. Got held up, he gasped, and tossed a drinks can and a packet of crisps to Paul, then dropped down beside him. The two boys tucked into their crisps. Midge, whose proper name was Michael Edge, was Paul's best friend, and his exact opposite. Midge was small, athletic, always alert, and a terrible chatterer. Paul took things much more slowly, and though he wasn't really fat, he was much taller and heavier than his friend. Both boys were ten years old, and both thought the same about school. Not much. Paul's father was Sergeant Oates, the local village policeman. Midge's parents owned a big private hotel on the outskirts of Port Santon, but Midge hardly ever saw them as they travelled about a great deal. Midge pointed a crisp at Paul's fishing line. That's a new float, isn't it? he said. You had a red one before. Paul nodded. Kate fed it to old Butch, he replied with a grin. Funny how the dog hadn't been sick, he thought. Then he felt a twinge of sadness. Mentioning his sister Kate reminded him she wasn't at home anymore, so he went on quickly. Dad says that dog's got a cast-iron stomach. They sat in silence for some time, enjoying the peace and drowsily listening to the tinkling water and the hiss and swish of the breeze in the leaves overhead. Buzzing flies danced amongst the reeds, and a dragonfly hovered over the glittering water. It was bliss. Paul sighed and let all his worries drift away. A few minutes later, Midge glanced at Paul's green float. Something had caught his eye. He nudged Paul. Look there, he said. Paul jerked his rod and began to reel in his line furiously. No, not your line. There, look. Midge pointed further out. What's that white thing? Paul's gaze followed the pointing finger. He saw a small white shape drifting in the stream just below the lazily hovering dragonfly. At first glance, he thought it was a bit of paper or a small plastic bag. Then, as it floated nearer, he could see it properly. It's a dead fish, he said. They float stomach up like that when they're dead. I'll bury it then, Midge said getting up and reaching into the water with a stick. He stopped and pointed again. Hey, look, there's another, and another. Paul scowled. Someone fishing further upstream must have kept them out of the water too long without a keep net. They can't be proper fishermen. If they were, they wouldn't hurt or kill the fish, Dad says. He told me, but his voice trailed off as two more fish drifted past, then more, until a whole shoal of tiny fish came by all upside down, all dead. There are dozens, Midge gasped. What's wrong? Paul shrugged his shoulders. The boys crouched at the water's edge. Suddenly, Midge wrinkled his nose, sniffed, and backed away from the stream. Poor! What a smell! Look, there's a sort of film on the water. Paul could see an oily, rainbow-coloured film floating in the middle of the stream just below the dancing dragonfly. Do you think it's the stuff that stinks? Midge asked. Paul shrugged his shoulders again. Suppose it must be. It probably poisoned the fish, too. Who would put poison in the stream? Midge asked, his eyes wide with astonishment. It's an awful thing to do. 
Just imagine all the creatures that might drink the water. Cows, birds, dogs. He shuddered. Paul was peering closely at the dragonfly as it hovered over the stream. Look at that, he said. What's it doing? The dragonfly was behaving very oddly, flicking this way and that, jerking up and down in a frantic way. Suddenly it dipped, dropped onto the oily water, and lay struggling in the rainbow film. Before the boys could do anything to help it, the dragonfly twitched and lay still. Paul was trying to puzzle out what had happened to their quiet, peaceful stream and why anyone should want to put poison in it. When the first rumbles of thunder echoed round the valley, big drops of rain splashed onto the oily film, breaking it up and disturbing the rainbow colours. Come on, said Paul, glancing up at the heavy clouds. It's going to pour. Let's tell Dad about this. He'll know what to do. He began to collect up his fishing tackle. The rain suddenly started a bucket down, and in seconds both boys were drenched. They slipped, slithered and sloshed through the puddles, all along the muddy farm lanes till they reached the main road. Then they ran fairly easily and made better time, though their shoes were slopping with water. Soon they were back at Paul's house. They darted in the back porch, dropping the fishing tackle as they passed. Then they raced straight into the front room of the house, which was also the local police station. Sergeant Oates was sitting at the cluttered desk. He had the telephone in one hand and was making rapid notes on a pad in front of him. He looked up quickly as the boys burst in. Dad, Paul began. Forge Mill Street. Shh. His father put his hand over the receiver. I'll talk to you later. Out, he hissed. But Dad, Paul insisted. Out. His father pointed his pencil at the door. Yes, Inspector, I've got that. Counterfeit, you say? Paul pushed Midge out of the office and into the little kitchen. He glanced round quickly and was glad to see his grandfather was not there. He had realised too late that the phone call must be serious. His father only snapped when he was dealing with important police work. He should have known better than to have interrupted him. His father wasn't often cross. It was his mother who had flown off the handle most days, and that was at his father, not him. Paul was greeted noisily by Butch, his old dog, and they patted him as they threw off their wet clothes. Paul raided the biscuit tin and the fridge for milk. Then they settled down on the kitchen window seat to wait for Paul's father. They had to wait a long time, but when at last Sergeant Oates came into the kitchen, Paul noticed he was his usual cheery self again. OK now. What was so mightily important that you had to charge into the office like a couple of untrained elephants, he said, as he helped himself to a biscuit from the tin. He glanced at his watch. Grandfather will be back soon. So come on, out with it. What's wrong? So Paul, with many interruptions from Midge, told his father about the dead fish in the stream. We think someone has poisoned the stream, Midge said confidently. Polluted it, on purpose. Accidental, more like. Sergeant Oates said thoughtfully. We've had some pretty heavy rainfall recently. Probably something has been washed out to stream from the fields on each side. I wouldn't call that deliberate poisoning. What sort of thing? Midge asked. Oh, you name it, Sergeant Oates replied. Fertilizers, insecticides, weed killers, any number of things. Farmers use masses of chemicals these days. Most farmers are extremely careful, but accidents do happen. Mostly, though, the heavy rain is the culprit. It washes the stuff out of the soil quite naturally. Can't the farmers be fined or something? asked Paul. Certainly, for deliberate pollution, said Sergeant Oates. But even then, it's very hard to prove. Sorry. He glanced at the rain streaming down the kitchen windows. I've got to go and check the harbour. Oh, by the way, when you're not watching the stream, keep your eyes open for any strange yachts anchored in the quiet bays round here especially French boats. Paul looked puzzled. Why, Dad? We're making a check on all foreign boats in the area, said his father vaguely. Tell your grandfather I'll be late back tonight, and don't give him any trouble. Promise? Without waiting for a reply, he turned his collar up against the wet and went out into the lashing rain. Suppose I'd better go too, sighed Midge. But I'll be back and we can check out the stream again just as soon as this rain eases up. A few minutes later, he too left the little house-come-police station and disappeared into the rain. It rained for two days. When Midge and Paul went back to the stream, 
they found that the place where they had sat and fished on the Friday was under several feet of water. Gallons of peat-brown water tumbled and creamed round the stones and boulders, and all round the willow tree roots. Paul pushed his hands deep into his pockets. No way of seeing anything in that, he said with disgust. We'll come back another day, Midge suggested. Let's try out the new Space Invader machine in Joey's cafe. Chapter 2 And More Midge and Paul cycled the long way home each day for the next week, just so that they could check the stream. But there was never anything special to see. Then, on a Thursday afternoon, two weeks later, they were standing by the edge of the stream, watching the water gurgling amongst the mossy pebbles. There had been a few days of really hot weather, so that the water level had dropped and was even lower than on the day the boys had first discovered the dead fish. Look there! Paul pointed excitedly to the far side of the stream. Midge shaded his eyes. Where the water swirled slowly round in a little pool, he saw glittering oily rainbow colours. A small white shape floated pathetically in the middle. I see it, he said, screwing up his eyes. It's not a fish, though. It's a small bird, and it's dead. The two boys watched the dead bird circle slowly in the film. Poor thing said Paul quietly. The smelly film must have killed it. He crouched down close to the water and sniffed. Phew, it does pong. It smells bad enough to kill anything, agreed Midge. He found a stick and reached over the water towards the dead bird. Then he scooped it towards him. Don't touch it, Paul warned. I'll get it out. He took Midge's stick and poked the bird to the side of the stream then out onto the pebbles at his feet. He scowled at the wet little body. What sort of bird is it? he asked curiously. He didn't know much about birds, but Midge did, or so he said. Hmm, could be a moorhen. Let's show it to your dad. Paul shook his head. Can't, he's away in Dover till tomorrow night. Sergeant Luke is here in charge till then, and he's a grouch. Let's wait till dad gets back. Midge nodded. He remembered the night Sergeant Luke had caught him sitting on top of a bus shelter down by the harbour, a night Midge wasn't likely to forget. Only one thing, Paul mused. If it rains tonight or tomorrow, this will all get washed away and there'll be nothing left to show, Dad. Suddenly Midge jumped up in the air. Your grandfather, he shouted. Wasn't he in the police? Sure he was in the police. In the ark, Paul replied with a giggle. Suddenly, Midge darted up the muddy bank of the stream. Wait here, he called. Don't go away. I'll be as quick as I can. He disappeared through the bushes. Paul sat down on the pebbles and sighed. Maybe this was another of Midge's weird ideas. He often had them. Most of the kids at school couldn't stand Midge. They said he was a swat and a knoll and even a bit crazy. But they had to admit he was clever and very often right about things. Paul watched the swirling, oily film. It reminded him of the petrol splash puddles outside his uncle's garage in the village. All rainbow squiggles and bubbles. He frowned. Maybe the stuff was petrol. But if so, how did it get into the water? There was no garage this far up the stream. Almost half an hour had passed, when there was a loud crashing in the bushes, and Midge was back again. He carried a large jam jar in one hand, its screw-top lid in the other. Hi, Midge called, and he slithered down the muddy bank and joined Paul at the water's edge. He held the jar under Paul's nose. What's that for? Paul demanded, backing away hastily. We'll collect some of the smelly water in here, Midge explained. Then you can show it to your dad when he gets back, right? Paul watched Midge bend down and carefully scoop some of the scummy water into the jam jar. Screw back the lid and tighten it firmly. There, he said. Paul wondered what his grandfather would do if he saw the dirty water in the jar. Midge had better look after it. Then he had a brilliant idea. Old Jumbo, he said excitedly. Let's take the jar to school in the morning and get Jumbo to test it for us. Then when Dad comes home, we can tell him what's poisoning the stream. Midge looked doubtful. What if Jumbo won't do it? Oh, he will, Paul said confidently. He loves doing anything like this. 
All the teaching staff have had their garden soil tested by him. We'll give it to him first thing, so he can work on it all day if he wants to. Great, agreed Midge, though he wasn't really too sure about getting a teacher involved. What about taking the dead bird too, he asked, as he gently poked the little bundle of damp feathers with his foot. Paul shook his head. No, I don't think so. He'll only start asking questions, and maybe want to investigate the stream himself. This is enough to begin with. He took the jar from Midge and put it down carefully on a rock. You'd better take it home with you. Come on, let's see what else we can find. But Midge had already begun to dig a hole with a stick in the muddy bank. We'll have a funeral for the bird first. Next morning, Paul and Midge arrived at school unusually early, hoping to catch the science master before the bell went for classes. Jumbo, Mr. Thomas, was slightly dotty, small and round as a ball. He was always in school before anyone else. The boys found him in the science room, surrounded by odd-shaped glass bottles and tubes and jars of coloured chemicals. You ask, said Paul, thrusting the jar at Midge as they reached the door. Excuse me, sir, Midge began, overflowing with politeness. We wondered if you would have time to check this and tell us what's in it, please. And he handed the jam jar to the little man. Mr. Thomas took the jar in his podgy hands and peered at the scummy water through his thick glasses. He shook the jar and frowned at the oily bubbles. Then he pushed his glasses up on his bald head. Hmm, he muttered. Unusual. Where did you get this? Not from the kitchen tap, I hope. <laughs> he beamed at the boys and chuckled at his own joke. Tell me about it. So Midge and Paul began to tell him about the dead fish in the stream. They hadn't got very far when the bell shrilled for morning assembly. Leave it to me, boys. Come back on your way home tonight. I'll know something by then and give you my report, the fat master said cheerfully, and the boys ran. That morning, the science class was more than usually boring. Mr. Thomas set them all a very long and uninteresting paper to work on, while he took Midge's jar, retreated into the little side laboratory, surrounded himself with bottles of chemicals, put a notice on the door warning everyone to keep away, then opened the jar and got to work on the evil-smelling water. When Paul met up with Midge in the corridor outside the science room just after four that afternoon, both boys were tingling with excitement. Do you think he's finished? Paul asked anxiously. You needn't have worried. As they went into the room, Mr. Thomas was ready and waiting for them. He handed Paul a long sheet of paper covered with letters and numbers. Chemical formulae, Midge guessed, but neither he nor Paul could begin to understand them. Mr. Thomas saw the blank looks on their faces, and he grinned impishly. He took a sheet of paper and put on his thick glasses. Well... Briefly, he said, the sample you gave me contains the usual types of nasties you'd expect to find in a somewhat dirty stream near farms, but... He paused and frowned over his glasses. There are a couple of rather unusual things about that oily film on top of the sample. It contains heavy traces of waterproof inks and a large proportion of some sophisticated chemical compounds, including benzene. Benzene, said Midge. I've heard the name. What is it, a fertilizer? The little man burst out laughing. Oh, dear me, no, he chortled. It's pretty poisonous. Quite a dangerous chemical to meddle with. I can't think how it got into your stream. Any ideas? The boys exchanged glances. Weed killer, suggested Paul. Mr. Thomas shook his head. Well, what's it used for, Midge asked. Mr. Thomas looked at the sheet of notes again. The benzene compound is a grease solvent, a very sophisticated, super-efficient and super-expensive cleaning fluid, probably used in a chemical works. But as I said before, I can't think how it got to be in your stream. There aren't any chemical works in this area at all. It's very puzzling. He frowned over his glasses at the boys, but they were spared answering his questions as the phone rang. Mr. Thomas handed Paul a sheet of paper filled with symbols and picked up the phone. Paul and Midge quickly slipped out of the room. What do you make of it? Midge asked as they cycled down the school drive. Beats me, said Paul. Grease solvents, dyes. 
Let's go and see if we can find where the stuff comes from, said Midge excitedly. We can check up the stream. We've plenty of time before tea. How about it? Great, replied Paul, and they cycled off at top speed through the busy village towards Forge Mill Stream. Chapter 3 The Haunted Mill Paul and Midge stood by the willow tree, looking at the bubbling water in the stream and getting their breath back. There, in the little pools of semi-still water amongst the stones, was the rainbow film. Let's look upstream, see if we can find where the stuff's coming from, Paul suggested. He crossed the stream, stepping from boulder to boulder. I'll search this side. You stay over there and search the bank. Keep your eyes skinned for anything. Such as? Midge asked, looking around vaguely. Tins, cans, bottles... You know, anything that shouldn't be in the stream, Paul shouted back, and he set off, leaving Midge on the opposite bank. Paul moved carefully along the water's edge, peering amongst the stones and ferns, watching out for containers of any sort. Very soon Midge had rushed ahead and was out of sight. Gradually the stream narrowed and deepened, and the stones and pebbles became larger. Paul scoured the banks, but found nothing, not even a rusty can. There was no rubbish at all. It was clear that not many people came so far out of the village. Hey, there! Midge shouted from up ahead, and Paul rushed to join him. Midge was standing on a boulder, pointing to a tiny stream that bubbled into the main stream. Looks like a ditch, said Paul. It's not much more than a trickle. I'll check it out, said Midge, and he pushed his way through the greenery and bushes and disappeared up the narrow side stream. Paul sat down on a boulder to wait. He noticed that the oily squiggles were still floating downstream. It's further on, he thought. Wherever is it coming from? Midge reappeared seconds later, shaking his head. It's a ditch. There's no sign of the smelly stuff up there. Paul pointed to the main stream. It's still here, he said. OK, let's press on, said Midge, and he set off again, splashing through the water and slipping on wet stones. Paul sighed, stood up, and slowly followed his friend. Midge always dashed into things like a bull elephant at full speed. For the next hour or so, the boys struggled on, checking each tiny side drain and ditch for chemicals. But the oily film was still only in the main stream, and was always ahead of them. The stream was now very narrow, and the trees and bushes overhung the steep bank's sides, making it quite dark. It was very hard to see in some places, and very midgy. Instead of going ahead, Midge stayed with Paul, and they had to help each other over many of the large slippery boulders. At last they climbed a small but steep waterfall, and the stream levelled out. They were on the edge of some flat, scrubby fields, with the low rolling hills and moors beyond. Midge pointed to a clump of stunted trees in a low dip of the rolling pasture. Just visible was an old grey building. Let's go and have a look, he said. The building stood at the edge of the stream, almost hidden by low, thick bushes. It looked ruined. There were holes in the roof, and the chimney was broken. At one side they could see the remains of a huge wheel leaning against the wall, its broken rungs in a small ditch at right angles to the stream. It's an old mill, Midge whispered. Paul nodded. I know, he said. Don't you recognize it? He paused. It's the haunted mill. It looks different from this side. I think the road must be over there. He pointed to the distant trees. Let's look, Midge said excitedly, and he set off towards the old building. Paul sighed and followed reluctantly. They reached the side of the mill and pushed their way through the bushes and clinging brambles keeping as close to the walls as possible, and peering carefully round each corner, just in case there was anyone about. They turned one corner and came upon the mill pond. This was a square, weed-fringed stretch of stagnant water. A deep ditch led from the pond to the stream, and a rotten wooden door with a rusty screw on top held back the main water from the pond, letting only a trickle past the broken mill wheel into the main stream. 
The boys leaned over the wooden pond railings and stared at the dark water. There! Paul pointed at the scum. Rings and swirls of fractured rainbow colours covered the dirty surface, and a couple of dead fish floated against the reeds. He bent and ran his hand over the green, moss-covered stones at the edge of the pond. He sniffed his fingers, then wrinkled his nose. This is the stuff, all right. It's right here in the pond. He turned and stared at the grey mill. Could it be coming from in there? Suppose so, Midge muttered. But it looks deserted. Even the windows are boarded up. And I've never seen anyone about here when we've been before. He paused thoughtfully, looking from the mill to the filthy pond. No, I think the chemical is coming from a tin that's in the pond. Or maybe stuck in the reeds over there. He pointed to the far side. But Paul was still looking at the mill. It could be used as a store by the farmer who owns the land here, he said. I'd like a look, wouldn't you? said Midge. Paul didn't answer. They circled the mill, looking carefully behind the bushes, searching for a door. They pulled the branches of bushes away from the walls, so that they could see behind them. And in no time at all, Paul found what they were looking for. Together they pulled away the springy branches that almost hid the small door from view. Look, said Midge, there's a path right against the wall, leading to the main track. Paul could see a number of heavy footprints on the path. The farmer must use it, he said. Midge went boldly up to the door and put his eye to a small knot hole. Then he put his ear to it. After a few seconds, he shook his head. Can't hear anything. Let's have a quick look inside. Paul frowned. Everyone said Kelly's mill was haunted. He didn't know anyone who had actually seen a ghost, but he didn't really want to be the first. He looked for a doorknob, but there wasn't one. He took a deep breath and pushed the door casually, and it swung open quite easily with a squeak. Midge grinned. Great, he said. Paul glanced round fearfully. Midge pushed past him and stepped into the mill. Paul followed. He didn't want to be left on his own. The door swung to behind them, leaving them in almost total darkness. In a few seconds, they found they could see reasonably well in the dim light that filtered through the wooden slats over the high windows. They were in a long, low room. It ran the full length of the building and contained a pile of rusty cog wheels and bits of metal stacked in a heap in the centre of the floor and a smaller heap of chains and ropes in the corner close to the door. A flight of rickety steps led to the floor above, but they didn't look at all safe. There were great gaps in the floor and long cobwebs hanging from the beams. Looks like the place could fall down any minute, whispered Paul nervously. Come on, let's go. Wait, I want to look at that pile of wheels, said Midge. He walked carefully across the dusty floor towards the heap. It's only old mill machinery, said Paul, edging towards the door. There might be some tins or cans underneath them, Midge replied. He bent over the heap and poked it with his feet. Paul sniffed. <laughs> There's a funny smell in here. The stuff from the pond, of course, said Midge. That's why I want to look at this rubbish. But there doesn't seem to be anything. Only old bits of rusty iron. No cans or... He stopped as both boys heard a distinct click. Paul jumped. What's that? he whispered. Did you touch something? Before Midge could answer, they heard a low whine that made the skin on Paul's neck creep. Rapidly, the whine became a hiss and swish that grew louder and faster till the whole rickety floor was shaking beneath the boy's feet. Paul glanced at Midge, and they both bolted for the door. They kept running till they reached the village and charged into Paul's house. Paul's grandfather was sitting at the kitchen table, calmly reading a newspaper that was spread out in front of him and eating peppermints from a large bag at his elbow. Have a mint, he said, pushing the bulging bag towards them without looking up from his paper. The boys flopped down on the bench seat across from the old man. Each took a fiery hot peppermint. Paul was glad his grandfather was there. He wasn't always easy to talk to, but he was always ready to listen 
and he was a whole lot better than grouchy Sergeant Luke. The old man peered at the boys over his glasses. Trouble? he asked quietly. Dad not home yet? Paul asked. The old man shook his head. Then he took his glasses off, folded his paper, and stared at them. Got the whole station to ourselves. Want to tell me something? Paul glanced at his friend and nodded. He could barely speak for the red-hot mint, so Midge told the old man what had happened at the mill. Paul's grandfather listened in silence, only occasionally crunching his mints. When Midge had come to the end, the old man nodded. You've been listening to the old story, then, he asked. Paul looked blankly at Midge, then at his grandfather. What old story? That Kelly's mill is haunted, he replied, looking surprised. Surely you've heard all about it. We know it's supposed to be haunted, said Paul, but we didn't know what happened there. I'll tell you then. While you both get your breath back, said Paul's grandfather, settling back in his chair. Some eighty or one hundred years ago, the mill belonged to Wally Kelly. He was a bit odd, so they say. Eccentric. He had a blacksmith's forge at the mill. He popped another mint in his mouth. That's why the stream is called Forge Mill Stream. Anyway, Kelly made and repaired farm tools and the like. Somehow he adapted the water wheel to work the bellows for him. Clever chap, but a bit foolish too. He paused to crunch his mint. And what happened? Paul urged. Kelly didn't get much trade out there. It's much too far out from the village, as you well know. And there aren't many farms out that side of the village anyhow. Well, the stupid fellow began to drink quite heavily. And one day he got so drunk that he fell in his own mill pond and drowned. And ever since then, on certain days, you can hear the forge bellows working and the water wheel turning all on their own. He sat back with a look of triumph. Paul shuddered. Well, we heard something, he said firmly, and it sounded pretty scary to me. Suddenly the front door slammed, startling them all. Dad! cried Paul, jumping to his feet. He's back! Sergeant Oates strode into the kitchen and gave Paul a friendly punch. Paul jumped up and down, returning the punches. Hey, watch it! Sergeant Oates gasped. Paul's grandfather stood up. Glad you're back. Had a good trip. Looks like it's been a busy day or two. He grinned at the boys. Just been telling the lads about Kelly's mill. He picked up the mints. I'll put the tea on. You staying, Midge? Don't listen to his tales, boys, Sergeant Oates said as he took off his jacket and hung it up. Dad's enjoyed telling that old story for years now. I reckon he started the rumour about the mill being haunted in the first place. The old man laughed, but Sergeant Oates saw the worried look on Paul's face. The boys heard something up there this afternoon, the old man said as he began to lay the table. Sergeant Oates looked interested. Such as? This time Paul explained what had happened in the old mill. His father nodded. I know, he said. I've heard strange noises at the mill myself. Scared me half to death till I found out what it was. And? Both boys leaned forward anxiously. I used to go to the mill with my pals when I was about your age. The noises terrified us. Then we discovered that it was barn owls all the time. The mill is a great place for them to roost. Bats, too. But it was the owls that really scared us. Paul frowned. It didn't sound very like owls, he said quietly. Suddenly he remembered the sheet of chemical formulae. He took the paper from his pocket and handed it to his father. Then he explained that they had given a sample of the stream water to their science master at school to be tested. Sergeant Oates took the paper and glanced down the rows of letters and numbers. Now that's a different matter, he said. Good thinking, boys. I'll get down to this as soon as I can. Sorry, but I've got a good deal on at the moment with being away. But we've... Paul began, but the sudden ringing of the telephone interrupted him. What did I tell you? Sergeant Oates said as he hurried into the office. Paul and Midge went into the garden. That noise, said Midge slowly. It didn't sound anything like an owl to me. 
And if the mill's been empty for so long, how come those chains there were almost new? What chains? asked Paul. In the corner by the door, some old ropes and chains, and some shiny, obviously new chains too, I'm sure. Supper! A shout came from the kitchen. I'd better go, said Paul. Midge started off down the dark garden. Me too. See you in the morning, straight after breakfast, OK? Paul mumbled agreement, and Midge vaulted the gate and disappeared down the back lane. Paul stood for a moment or two, staring into the dim garden. That noise they'd heard at the mill was much more scary than barn owls, and a lot louder. His grandfather called again, with a warning that supper was going cold. Paul grinned and went quickly back into the cosy kitchen. Chapter 4 Night Adventure Paul leaned on the landing windowsill and gazed at the little boats far below in the harbour. They looked just like toys bobbing in the bath as they moved gently on the evening tide. Every night on his way to bed, Paul spent a few minutes looking down at the harbour. It was a sort of ritual. Each time recently he hoped he would see one special boat, a very beautiful white yacht, a shanty. It had appeared with the beginning of the tourist season in the spring, and Paul wished it was his. He idly watched the fishermen preparing their boat for the night's fishing. It seemed funny to think of night when it was all still light. Then he shivered, remembering the haunted mill and the owls. Then, as he scanned the line of boats, he caught sight of his yacht, and his eyes gleamed. He followed its path as it made its way towards the marina. Suddenly, a small, fast red speedboat shot right across its bows, and the yacht had to swerve. The boat sped through the scattered dinghies and out into the main harbour, leaving a creamy wake and tossing the yachts like tethered corks. The red boat raced out of sight round the headland. Paul frowned. He had seen it before. It was Midge's father's boat, a new, fast motorboat. Paul guessed Midge's father must be taking it out on a trial trip. Lucky man. But he'd have an accident if he carried on like that much longer. Paul sighed again. He hated going to bed whilst the sun was still shining. Still, lights were beginning to come on in ones and twos in the houses, and the long line of coloured lights that looped from lamppost to lamppost like a necklace all the way along the harbour front, Port Santon's only illuminations, had just flickered uncertainly into life in the darkening sky. Bed! His grandfather's voice came from the kitchen. Turn your light off in five minutes. Good night, he shouted. Paul, with a final glance at the harbour, went into his bedroom and climbed into bed. He reached a book down from the shelf over his head, opened it and put it down again. He turned the pages idly, letting his mind wander, as on every night recently. He thought about his mum and little sister, Kate, and he wondered what they were doing. Had they had sausage, beans and chips for tea? He grinned to himself. His mother's chips were soggy. It was funny how grandfathers were really great. It was now two weeks since his mum had finally packed her case, picked up Kate from school and left. Only fourteen days. But it had seemed longer to Paul. The same day his grandfather had moved in to help look after Paul and his father, and the shouts and quarrels and angry silences that had been part of Paul's life for the past three years, ever since his father's promotion to sergeant, were over. Paul missed his mum and naughty little sister. The house felt different, strangely quiet, not really the same home. Yet, in a way, he was slowly beginning to like it. He switched the light off and snuggled down under the cosy duvet until only his spiky ginger hair was uncovered. It was comfortable in his bed, his own private snug little world. The thoughts of the day's adventure in the weird mill drifted into his mind, and he quickly pushed them away. He yawned sleepily. 
he could hear his grandfather's voice droning in the kitchen. Paul grinned as he thought of their game of drafts after supper. For once, Paul had won, which hadn't pleased the old man. Paul remembered each move of the game as he had sat at the kitchen table, the board spread out in front of him, and the hot peppermints in their usual place by grandfather's side. Paul moved the pieces rapidly across the squares, and he was winning again. Suddenly, he noticed that the black and white game pieces were changing, and they were striped brown and white. And they had turned into peppermints. The old man laughed at him. Then suddenly, he scooped the peppermints up in his horny hands and threw the whole lot up in the air. Paul backed away. He thrashed out at the hard sweets with both hands as they came rattling down around him, and he woke, fighting with a duvet. He had been dreaming. Paul relaxed, smiled to himself, and turned over. But the rattling went on. He sat up wide awake, his heart thumping as he strained his ears, listening. There was no mistake. He turned to the window. It was quite dark now. He must have slept for some time. He glanced at the bedside table. The eerie green hands on the clock told him it was 10.50. The rattling came again. Someone was throwing gravel at the window pane. Paul wriggled out of bed and rushed to the window. He peered into the dark back garden. There, in the edge of the pool of light from the kitchen window, just as he had begun to expect, stood a small, thin figure. Oh, no, Paul groaned. I might have guessed. It was Midge. Quietly, Paul opened the window and leaned out. What's up? The thin figure beckoned urgently. Night adventure, he called. Then he stepped out of the light into the dense darkness by the dustbins. Paul sighed and quickly dragged on a pair of jeans and a thick sweater over his pyjamas. Every now and again, Midge got one of his brilliant ideas, and this was going to be one of them. A night adventure, he called it. Once they'd got up early and planned to swap everyone's milk left on the doorsteps, but they'd been too scared to actually do it. Another time in the snow, they'd been almost caught by the manor house gardener when they'd taken Midge's sledge up and down all the lawns and bankings at the manor. Once, Paul had got away, but Midge had been caught sitting on top of a bus shelter. Paul had to admit he quite enjoyed the thrill of being out when no one else was around, but he would never say so, especially not to Midge. He picked up his training shoes, opened the bedroom door, and listened. He could faintly hear the TV in the kitchen. Must be Dad on his own, he thought, as he could hear his grandfather snoring in the little room across the landing. Kate's room. Paul quietly tiptoed along to the bathroom. He slipped inside and closed the door quietly behind him. He listened again. There was still no sound of anyone coming upstairs. He pushed up the window and climbed out onto the windowsill, then dropped down lightly onto the lean-to shed roof. He sat down on the roof, slithered to the edge, jumped off onto the wet grass below, and with feet tingling icily, he ran to join Midge by the dustbins. Then he perched on the bins and put his training shoes on, whilst Midge hopped from one foot to another with excitement and impatience. Oh, come on, be quick, Midge urged. OK, then, said Paul. What's the matter? What do you want? Let's go to the mill. Paul's mouth dropped open. You're joking, he gasped. I'm not going there, not in the dark. He wriggled his wet toes in the scratchy shoes. Oh, come on, Midge coaxed. It'll be great. We'll explore the place without any grown-ups around. We won't get a chance if the police go crawling about there tomorrow. Paul shuddered as he remembered the weird noise. Well, you don't believe that stuff about the place being haunted, do you? Midge scoffed. Well, no, said Paul. But if it isn't, why doesn't someone live there? It's been empty for years. Anyhow, it'll be too dark to see anything. Bring a torch then, Midge said crossly. Haven't got one. Anyhow, I'm not going. It was weird in the daytime. It'll be ten times worse at night. You're mad. 
the two boys stood staring at each other in the darkness of the garden. Neither wanted to be the one to give way, and neither knew what to do next. Suddenly Midge decided, Let's go down to the harbour, then. We've done that heaps of times, every day, said Paul. I know, I know, said Midge impatiently, but not at night. It's different at night. We'll have a look around. I'm not going home without doing something. He paused. We could go burglar hunting. He grinned in the dark. I know. Let's play Tig in the cemetery. Daft, Paul exploded. Anyhow, Dad will be on duty soon. I don't want him to catch me out. There'll be trouble. You're scared of ghosts, Midge mocked. I'm not, Paul snapped back. Then come on, I'm going. Go then, Paul shouted into the darkness behind the bin. Then, seeing the lighted kitchen window, he whispered, I'm going back to bed. But he didn't move. I'll go on my own. Tell you about it tomorrow. Bye, Midge said, turning back to the gate. Paul stopped him. There'll be trouble if we're caught or missed, he said again. Curiosity had won. There won't, Midge assured him. Mum and Dad are in London for a few days, so they won't even know. And your mum's not... He stopped suddenly, embarrassed. Coming? Paul nodded. But not for long, and not to the mill or the cemetery. Midge set off, and Paul followed him through the cluttered garden, dodging by instinct the rusty climbing frame and rubbish. They vaulted the back gate, dropped quietly into the lane, and jogged towards the village and harbour. The boys hurried along the narrow pavements. Port Sandton was a very small village, and it didn't have many street lamps away from the harbour, so the back streets and lanes were dark and gloomy. It was clammy damp, too. Wispy drifts of sea mist were blowing in and creeping down the streets like steam from a giant kettle. It was strangely quiet as the mist muffled all sounds, even their own footsteps on the slippery path. They passed the bright open door of a large pub. A few hunched figures stumbled out of the noisy, stuffy-smelling bar and shuffled away into the mist. No one took any notice of the boys. They'd run along a quiet side street. When they came to the ornate iron gates of the tree-sheltered cemetery, Midge paused. We'd be a whole lot quicker if we took a shortcut through here, he suggested, knowing what Paul would reply. But Paul jogged on, ignoring him. See you then, Midge called, and disappeared. Paul skidded to a stop. He was on his own, and by the eerie cemetery. Panic seized him. He wanted to run, but, just like in a bad dream, his feet stayed rooted to the spot. He looked round helplessly. The weird shadows cast by the dim light and tall trees in the street made his heart thump. This was worse than the mill. But he wasn't going to follow Midge to the cemetery for anything. He pulled himself together. The swinging gallows ahead of him that sent cold shivers down his back was only an old-fashioned lamp with a broken light bulb, and the rows of sharp native spears aimed at him were just the iron railings around the dreaded cemetery. He grinned sheepishly, took a deep breath, and ran on as fast as his wobbly legs would carry him to the end of the street, round the corner, and along the high street. In five minutes, Paul was standing on the quay at the harbour. And there was Midge, sitting like a gnome, curled up on an old stone bollard, and eating chips from a small plastic tray. Paul gasped. Midge really was the end at times. Want one? Midge offered the greasy tray to Paul. Didn't have enough money with me for two lots, so we'll share these. Paul took a chip and sat down on the next bollard. Where'd you go? he asked. Through the cemetery? Midge nodded. Shortcut, then back door of Joe's cafe. The boys ate on in silence till the tray was empty. Then Midge tossed it neatly into a nearby fish box. OK, he said, wiping his greasy fingers on his jersey. You ready? Let's explore. Chapter 5. At the Harbour. The two boys walked to the end of the quay, 
Below them, a flight of steps led down to the tar-black water swirling against the weed-hung wall. Let's go down, said Midge. He led carefully, picking his way so as not to slip on the worn, wet steps. It was all very still and quiet, apart from the boy's own soft footsteps. The only sounds were the distant, angry meow of a cat disturbed in the dark shadows of the car park, and the gentle slip-slop of the water at their feet. A drunk's tuneless singing echoed over the harbour, shattering the peace. Then nothing. It felt to Paul as if they were the only beings about in the whole village. Midge leaned close to Paul. Eerie, isn't it? Better than lying awake in bed, though. Paul was about to say he quite liked being in bed, and anyway he hadn't been awake, when suddenly he heard the unmistakable sound of a high-powered engine approaching. Quick, said Midge, let's pretend they're smugglers. Come on, we'll hide. He leapt up the steps, pulling a reluctant Paul behind him. He dragged Paul down behind a big pile of evil-smelling fish boxes at the end of the quay. Let's watch, he whispered. We'll imagine they're gold smugglers. Don't be stupid, Paul scoffed. It's probably only a fishing boat. You've no imagination, said Midge crossly. It's only a bit of fun. Paul ignored his friend. Night fishing, I expect, he said. But he frowned. It didn't sound like a fishing boat's engines. He knew a bit about them, yet this one sounded familiar. They listened to the throbbing of the powerful engine as the boat came nearer and began to slow down. The loud wailing of a police siren startled Paul. Must be his father out on patrol somewhere, maybe after the noisy drunk. What if he was to come along the quay? The siren wailed away into the distance and Paul relaxed. Suddenly the boat was there, creeping from the mist and entering a pool of light cast by the single key lamp. The boys peered cautiously from their hiding place. Funny, whispered Paul. It's not showing any lights. They're supposed to. What did I tell you? Smugglers, hissed Midge excitedly. The boat drifted towards the key steps and bumped softly against the wall. Paul and Midge could see it clearly, and Paul recognised it immediately. It's your dad's boat, he said. Midge leaned over and peered closely, his nose almost on the edge of the wall. Yes, that's l'oiseau, he said, but it shouldn't be. It's great, said Paul. I saw it earlier this evening. You are lucky. I wish we had a boat. Midge turned to Paul with a puzzled frown on his face. You can't have seen it tonight, he said quietly. Dad hasn't had it out except for a couple of mornings, and he won't let anyone else take it out, not even me. Paul glanced down at the boat. So, he asked. Dad's away, Midge said. He won't be home till tomorrow sometime. Paul's eyes grew round and bright in the darkness. And someone's pinched it, he said. Let's watch and see who it is. They crouched behind the stack of boxes again. No one would be able to see them in the deep shadow, but they, with care, could look through odd gaps and watch what went on in the boat below. The boat bumped lightly against the bottom step again. Paul could just make out three men. Two of them scrambled out of the boat, they unloaded some clinking cylinders onto the steps. Suddenly, the distant police siren wailed again. Quick, the man in the boat called urgently. Get that stuff out of the way. Move. One of the men on the steps jumped back into the boat and pushed it away from the quay. Immediately, the engine started up and the boat slipped quickly away into the mist in the main harbour. The other man picked up the cylinders and came slowly up the slippery steps. He paused at the top for a second or two, staring first into the mist, then scanning the quay and nearby car park. Apparently satisfied, he walked briskly along the quay, past the boy's hiding place towards the car park. As he passed them, Paul saw that the clinking cylinders he carried were air cylinders, the sort used by skin divers. Paul frowned. None of the men had been wearing wetsuits. In fact, 
The man carrying the cylinders was just wearing ordinary jeans and a sweater, and they didn't seem to have any fishing tackle with them. Midge, he whispered, there's something odd. I don't think... But Midge stopped him. I know that chap. He's Theo. Uncle Theo, the mad Greek, he said, a look of astonishment on his face. Your uncle, exclaimed Paul. Well, that explains the boat. No, it doesn't, said Midge. He's not a real uncle, only a friend of a friend of Dad's. He's staying at the hotel. He's very odd. Eats all his meals in his room. Says he can't stand people, the sea, or anything for that matter. And he makes me call him uncle. Yuck! He pulled a face at the man's back. I think he's supposed to be a sort of travel writer. The man had by now reached the car park. The boys stood up. It was dark enough along the quay for them to move without being seen. The man went straight to a dilapidated-looking car parked at the back. He put the cylinders in the boot, then got in, started the car, and was driving away when the boys reached the end of the quay. Hey, look at that, Paul pointed. We'd better warn him. He's going to lose his number plate. It's only fastened on at one end. Midge turned quickly, just in time to see the swinging number plate as the man drove rapidly away down the street. Too late, he said. Never mind. I'll tell him if I see him at the hotel. He paused and frowned. Paul, I didn't even know he had a car. He certainly doesn't keep it at the hotel. Midge and Paul were silent as they retraced their steps through the village, keeping away from the busy places like the disco and coffee bars. Paul's ears and eyes were alert for any sight or sound of his father. Midge wondered what the mad Greek was doing in his father's own brand new boat. Back at Paul's garden gate, they stopped and looked round to be sure the coast was clear. Odd seeing the Greek on your dad's boat, said Paul. He must have pinched it. Will your dad be mad? You bet, Midge replied. He'll be home in the morning. I'll tell him. Call for me first thing. It won't matter how early. Then he was gone into the shadowy darkness of the lane. Paul turned for home and the street lights snapped off, plunging the lane into pitch darkness. The church clock struck twelve as Paul crossed the garden, climbed through the bathroom window, and tiptoed back into his bedroom. He smiled to himself. No one had missed him, he thought, as he wriggled down into his ice-cold bed. He knew his mum would have, and she'd have been mad. He closed his eyes, and the bedroom light came on, there stood his grandfather in pyjamas and tartan dressing gown. And where do you think you've been? he demanded, peering short-sightedly at Paul. Paul leaned up on one elbow, opened his mouth to explain, then, seeing the look on the old man's face, he closed it again. There was a long silence. Paul had never seen his grandfather without his teeth before. He looked funny. But Paul didn't feel the least bit like laughing. And, young man, don't try to tell me you were asleep. I saw you sneaking back through the bathroom window. We'll talk in the morning, he said, and switched the light off and closed the door quietly behind him. At breakfast next morning, neither Paul's dad nor his grandfather mentioned the night's happenings. But Paul caught his grandfather's eye, and he knew that he hadn't forgotten. Maybe he hadn't told dad yet. And that, at least, was one good thing. Sergeant Oates hurried through breakfast. He was quieter than usual. You coming fishing this afternoon? Paul asked cautiously. You said you would on your next half day. Sorry, son, not a chance, his father replied between gulping his coffee, struggling into his tunic and tying his shoelaces. With a bit of a panic on at headquarters, he downed the last of his coffee and dashed into the office. Paul jumped up to follow, but his grandfather stopped him. Wait, don't bother him now, he warned. Some men from the French police are due any time. French police? Paul gasped in astonishment. It must be something serious. Someone from Interpol, the old man continued. 
so I wouldn't disturb him if I were you. What's happened? Paul asked. His grandfather ignored the question. Never had one of those here in my time as sergeant. In those days, police work was much simpler. The most exciting thing we had was when the vicar was caught speeding. Paul stuffed the last of his toast in his mouth, then got up to go, but his grandfather stopped him. Hang on, lad. We've to have a little talk, remember? Now sit down. Paul sat down. His grandfather sat across from him, his face serious. Now, where did you go last night? And what were you up to? Paul shrugged. Just went to the harbour, that's all, he mumbled. Why? His grandfather eyed him suspiciously. Couldn't sleep. Paul scuffed his toes on the floor, hoping his grandfather wouldn't see he was telling a lie. The old man said nothing. He watched Paul carefully and knew he was not telling the truth, and that made him feel uncomfortable. After what seemed ages, he sighed. Your dad's got quite enough to think about just now, without worrying about you, lad. So if you've nothing else to tell me... Paul waited to hear what was to come next. For the time being, I'll not say anything to him. If... The old man pointed an accusing finger at Paul. If you'll promise, promise, mind you, you'll not sneak out again. And... He stood up, went to the back door and beckoned to Paul. As a punishment, you'll clear this mess up and I'll say no more. Paul saw the determined look on his grandfather's face. This was one job he wouldn't be able to wriggle out of. The garden certainly was a mess. The cluttered and matted square of grass, once a lawn, the climbing frame and weed-choked flower beds were, he had to admit, awful. I've been asking you to do it ever since I came. So now I'll give you till the weekend, weather permitting, right? Paul nodded. The garden looked huge and as tangled as a jungle. Can Midge help? he asked. You can ask who you like, but get it done. Now, off you go. Paul breathed a quick sigh of relief and rushed off to find Midge. The old man watched Paul go and smiled. Funny. He remembered dodging out at night when he was Paul's age. Chapter 6 Inside the Mill Paul ran all the way to Midge's home. He darted through the tall gateposts, past the big white hotel signboard, and started up the twisty drive. Suddenly Midge dropped down out of the bushes and landed in front of Paul. At last! he exclaimed crossly. I've been waiting ages. Paul briefly explained what had happened. Then together they set off back through the village, intent on reaching the mill by the shortest route. Midge began to run, but Paul stopped him. Take it easy. There won't be any police there today, he said. Dad's got someone from the French police in the station. There's some sort of big flap on. I bet he won't even have time to warn the farmers about the chemicals in the stream. He paused. Then a bright idea came to him. What about telling them ourselves, he suggested. Great, said Midge. But let's check the mill first. I've been thinking about that noise we heard. I don't think it was ours at all. It sounded like some sort of machinery to me. I brought my torch today so we can have a proper look round. He took a small pencil torch from his pocket. I know it's not very big, but it'll have to do. Trust Midge to be prepared, thought Paul. As they passed the busy harbour, Midge pointed to the marina. There's Loiseau, tied up to that red boy. Dad can't keep her in the boathouse, she's too long. I meant to tell you, Dad came home whilst I was waiting for you. I told him I'd seen the Greek out in our boat. He grinned. Didn't tell him what time, though. Anyhow, he said I was mistaken. Why? asked Paul his eyes not on the red speedboat, but on the beautiful white yacht which was moving slowly out of the harbour. Midge spread his hands. Dad says it couldn't have been the Greek, as he has a thing about water. He won't even go in a boat, never mind pinching ours. 
So I told him you'd seen Loiseau at night, too. And he said you're mistaken, too. He hasn't had it out since last week. He says you've mixed it up with another boat. Then he added firmly, But I'm almost sure it was the Greek. And I'm almost sure it was the same boat I saw going out right in front of the yacht, said Paul. I think we've got a mystery here. They hurried away from the harbour, through the narrow, crowded streets, till they came out of the village onto the rolling countryside. They'd left the main road and set off up a muddy farm track. After a quarter of an hour's stiff climbing, they reached the crest of the hill and stood hot and breathless in the brilliant sunlight. The valley lay spread out below them, a patchwork of greens with thick woolly clumps of trees and long fluffy lines of hedges, and there, in the lowest part, the glistening stream wound its way through the fields, past Kelly's mill and away to Port Santon and the sea. The mill looked so ordinary in the fresh morning sunshine, but even so Paul shivered. Let's see what we can find, said Midge, and he started off down the hill. The going was easy at first across the short turf. The long spiky grass strands whipped their jeans as they ran. Sheep and cows scattered as they dashed through the fields towards the mill. Suddenly Midge stopped dead, and Paul stumbled into him. Look there, Midge whispered. Someone was walking quickly along the field track ahead of them, towards the mill. He had his back to the boys, so did not see them as he passed within one hundred metres of them. Can't see his face, said Midge. Just as well, he'd have seen us. At that moment, the man disappeared round the side of the mill. They hurried across the field and dropped gasping for breath on the grass behind the bushes at the side of the track. They peered through the leafy branches and watched, wondering what would happen next. He wasn't a policeman, said Paul. I know all the local police. For some minutes, nothing happened. There were no sounds from the mill. All they could hear was the water tinkling in the stream and the pigeons cooing on the mill roof above. He could be the farmer, Paul suggested. Midge stood up. Let's get closer and find out. He moved quietly through a gap in the scratchy hedge. Paul followed close behind. He was curious, but as usual wary, and secretly a little scared of what they might find. They had almost reached the mill, when the sound of raised voices sent both boys scuttling for shelter amongst the bushes right against the wall. The little door squeaked on its hinges, and Paul crouched even lower in the tiny space between the prickly bushes and the rough stone wall. He squeezed his eyes shut, hoping the men wouldn't see him, and strained his ears to catch any more sounds. The door squeaked again, and the boys heard feet scrunch on the gravel track. Two men came round the corner of the building, brushing against the boys' hiding place as they hurried along the path to the main track. Midge raised his head. He could see one man was tall, the other small, but both were thin and wore ordinary clothes. One man, however, was wearing a bright red woolen hat. They were speaking in such quiet voices that Midge couldn't catch a single word. Paul opened his eyes just in time to see the men reach a clump of thick trees, and almost immediately he heard a car door slam. The boys stood up, brushed grit from their jeans, and stepped out from the bushes. A dark-coloured car drove slowly away over the bumpy farm lane. Suddenly, Midge gasped. Look at that! The car's number plate was only fastened at one end, and it was swinging violently, scraping the ground as the car bumped and jolted over the ruts. It's the one we saw last night, Midge said. The Greek was driving it then, but... Was it the Greek in the mill just now? Paul asked. I didn't see. No, I didn't recognise either of them. Come on, before anyone comes back, let's look inside. And Midge led the way to the squeaking door. Quick, we may not get another chance, he said urgently. They stepped into the dark mill. It was very dark inside. Midge held the door open again a fraction, letting in a thin shaft of sunlight. 
Look there. He pointed to the pile of chains in the corner. What did I tell you? Some of them are new. They've still got oil on them. Then he let the door bang to and switched his torch on. He shone the narrow beam round the room. It was just as they had seen it before, with straw strewn about the dusty floor, the pile of old machinery, and the wide staircase leading to the floor above. Want to go up? Midge asked. It looks a bit rotten to me. No fear, Paul replied. Just look at the dust. No one's been up there for years. I can't see anything different today, he said, kicking the wheels and a rusty can of ancient screws and nails. Nothing here. He turned to come back to Paul and almost fell headlong as he caught his foot against something on the floor. Paul looked down and saw a shiny metal ring. Hey, he said excitedly, it's a trap door. He bent down and pulled at the ring, but it barely moved. Midge lent a hand and the trap door suddenly shot open. They pulled it right up then laid it back on the floor. There in front of them was a great dark hole. The boys knelt down and peered into the blackness. It's the cellar, Paul whispered. Midge shone his torch into the darkness and flashed it around. In the thin beam from the torch, they saw a flight of steep stone steps leading down into the cellar. This is where the men were, Midge whispered. Then he let the thin yellow torch beam travel over the cobbled stone floor. It shone on a stack of tins that could have been paint cans, some big boxes, and in the middle of the cellar, almost right below the trap door, a large table. On it was a large piece of black and shiny machinery. Midge lay down and leaned further through the door to see more. Paul wriggled forward to join. What is it? he whispered as the pinpoint of light flickered over the machine. No idea, Midge muttered. Can you smell the chemical stuff? It's here, all right. Must be something down there that's getting into the stream. He wrinkled his nose. And oil and dust and... Smells like the school office, said Paul with disgust. They stared at the cellar for some seconds. Then Paul sat up and peered at his watch. We'd better go. Let's tell Dad about this. You're joking, exclaimed Midge. If the stuff's down here, he motioned to the cellar, let's go and see. Besides, I want to look at that machine. He got up and started down the cellar steps. Paul sighed. He was curious, and the men had gone. So he followed Midge down the steep steps into the dark cellar. I'll pull the trap door shut, Paul said as he reached the bottom step. Whatever for? asked Midge, who was already flashing the torch around. Just in case, Paul replied vaguely. He went up and closed the door, then joined Midge at the foot of the steps. Midge's torch was so small, its light barely pierced the total blackness of the windowless room. Wait, said Midge, as Paul turned to go back up the steps to open the trap door again. There might be a light down here. He shone the torch onto the wall by the steps, looking for a switch, and almost immediately something caught his eye. It was a cord. We're in luck, he cried. He took hold of it and tugged, and the cellar was flooded with a harsh, cold light from the unshaded bulb hanging from the ceiling right over the steps. The two boys stood blinking in the bright light. Then they gazed round the room. It was a very good thing they had found the light, as the cellar was full of cartons, rubbish and junk. Almost as bad as our back garden, thought Paul. There were big cupboards along one wall, and right in the middle of the cellar, the heavy low table, like a workbench, and on it, the machine they had seen from the trap door. Look at that, Midge gasped, his voice full of excitement as he tiptoed to the table. Paul scowled. The machine, shiny with oil, wasn't the slightest bit like any farm machinery he'd ever seen. In fact, he was almost sure he recognised it. Midge was grinning all over his face. Don't you know what it is? he asked. Paul frowned. Well, I think so. 
A printing press at a guess? Right, agreed Midge. It's like the one in the school office, only bigger. You know, Millie's toy. Miss Miller's printing press. That's why the place smelled like the school office, when Millie's been printing posters. But what's it doing here? Midge didn't have any time to think of an answer. At that moment, they both heard the sound of a car engine revving close by. Then a door slammed. They're back, Paul gasped. They'll catch us. We haven't time to get out of here. Hide, hissed Midge. They glanced round anxiously looking for a hiding place. Then Paul opened one of the cupboards against the wall. It was full of tins. He tried the next one. Quick, in here. There's just about room to squash in next to these tins. The light, he cried. Midge quickly flicked the cord and the cellar was once more plunged into darkness. Then he dived for the cupboard, pulling the door closed behind him as heavy footsteps crossed the floor above. Midge and Paul squeezed in against the tins and listened. There was so very little room in the cupboard that the boys had to squash together, Midge standing, his face pressed against the door, and Paul crouching amongst the tins, his side against the back wall of the cupboard. They held their breath as the trap door squeaked open and dropped back with a crash on the floor. Then feet began to come down the steep steps into the cellar. Chapter 7 Trapped The boys didn't dare breathe as the two sets of footsteps came slowly down the steep wooden stairs. The men were talking quietly but the cupboard hiding place muffled the sounds, and the boys couldn't make out any words. When the men reached the bottom step, the light was switched on, and the beam of brightness shone into the stuffy cupboard, through the narrow slit in the ill-fitting door. Midge put his eye to the little slit. The gap was very small, and he couldn't see much at all, except that one man was bending over the press on the table, and the other, who wore a red woolen hat, was crouching over something on the cellar floor, something that rattled and clanged as he moved it. Paul couldn't see, but he recognised the sound and was puzzled. Midge wished the men would move so that he could see their faces. Paul wriggled in the confined space. What's going on? he hissed. Midge quickly put his hand over Paul's mouth. Shh, he whispered as he glanced back through the gap. Both men were now by the printing press. The man in the woolly hat nodded, then turned and strode straight towards the boy's cupboard. Midge shrank from the gap. They must have heard Paul. He clenched his fists, waiting for the door to open and almost hearing the shout as they were discovered. The man came closer, put his hand out and opened the cupboard. But not the boy's hiding place. The man had gone to the next cupboard. Woolly Hat went back to the table, carrying a large tin can. He unscrewed the lid, poured some of the contents onto a rag, and handed it to the other man. Suddenly the air in the cellar was filled with an evil smell, and fumes poured into the cupboard. Midge sniffed and wrinkled his nose. It was the oily chemical that had polluted the pond and the stream. The stuff came from right there, the tin that had just been taken from the cupboard. Midge put his mouth close to Paul's ear and told him what he had seen. We've got to tell your dad, Midge hissed. Then he looked through the gap again. One man was wiping the rag over parts of the press. Woolly Hat carried the tin back to the cupboard, put it away and closed the door. There was a funny, sharp snap, followed by another snap only much closer, and he went back to the table. Midge frowned in the dark. He didn't recognise the snapping sound, but Paul did. It reminded him of his grandfather's shed in the garden. Bolt, he hissed in Midge's ear. He's locked the cupboards. Suddenly there was a shivering swoosh, and the press started up. The noise was terrific in the small cellar, even though the press itself wasn't all that big but it shook the cupboards, and the boys felt sure the whole ramshackle place would collapse any minute. 
His swoosh groan, his swoosh groan, went the press. Let's have a look, Paul whispered. So carefully moving round, Midge let Paul put his eye to the tiny gap in the door. Sheet after sheet of thin paper was lifted from the press and laid very carefully to one side of the table. It was very thin paper, with a fine delicate pattern all over, a brownish-orange pattern, and the sheets of paper were all fairly small. Paul frowned thoughtfully. He wished he could see the men properly. Midge nudged Paul's arm. My turn now, he whispered. Not that he needed to. He could have shouted and the men wouldn't have heard him above the noise of the press. I've got cramp, he moaned. Come on, let me have a look. Wait, said Paul impatiently. They're printing labels or something. Daft, snorted Midge. What would anyone want to print labels out here for? Paul squinted through the gap again just as the press gave a wheezing sigh and stopped. The man took the last sheet of paper from the press, held it up to the light, and smiled. Damn good, he said. Then he laid the sheet with the others on the table. Woolly Hat picked up the pile, and both men went out of sight round the back of the table. What are they doing? Midge asked in an urgent whisper. No idea, Paul said quietly can't see them now. He paused. It's an odd place to do any printing. Oh, come on, let me look. My foot's gone to sleep, Midge insisted. But Paul silenced him quickly. He could hear a sort of clicking sound from behind the table. Suddenly, the men came back into sight carrying the papers. Paul looked, and the hairs on his neck began to tingle. He could hardly believe his eyes. The sheets of paper were smaller now and looked very much like banknotes. The men began to count the papers, then put them into neat bundles and fastened them with rubber bands. Woolly Hat picked them up and Paul heard the clanking metal again as the heavily built man lifted the cylinder onto the table. It was fat and yellow and black and exactly like a skin diver's air cylinder. Paul had guessed right. Woolly Hat unscrewed the black end of the cylinder and began carefully stuffing the wads of notes into it. Then, when all the papers were in, he screwed the black lid back on again and put the cylinder down. Right, said Woolly Hat. Let's get out of here. We're late. We'll miss the tide. Both men looked round quickly, then made for the steps. Woolly Hat carried the cylinder under his arm. They pulled the light cord and the cellar was once again plunged into pitch darkness. Then they hurried up the steps, dropped the trap door down with an echoing thump, and quickly left the mill. We've got to get out of here, said Paul as soon as the footsteps had disappeared into the distance. He pushed against the cupboard door, but it wouldn't move. So he pulled it, but still it resisted. It won't budge, he gasped. It's bolted. Let me try, said Midge, and he wriggled round and put his back to the door and pushed. It's locked all right, but the wood's old. It might be rotten. Come on, let's break it down. The boys banged at the door and heaved with their backs against it. What a noise, gasped Paul, as Midge kicked the bottom of the door with his heels. No one to hear us, Midge replied. Let's try once more. They both gave a mighty heave and with a ripping, splintering crack, the door burst its hinges. The bolt flew off with a bang, and the door fell to the floor with an ear-splitting crash. Paul, Midge, and the contents of the cupboard were spilled out onto the rough cobbles amongst the clutter. Phew, gasped Midge, fishing for his torch and flicking on the tiny beam. I thought I'd suffocate in there. Paul was already on his feet. Come on, we must tell Dad, quick. Midge scrambled up and made for the steps. We know where the smelly chemical comes from now, he said excitedly, flashing his torch over the tins on the floor. I know that, said Paul, but there's something much more important. Those two men are up to no good, and I think I know what it is. 
the boys dashed up the steps and out of the mill. Ignoring the track, they took the shortest way to the village, straight across the fields. They were in such a hurry, they never noticed a car parked in amongst the trees a little way along the track. Three men were sitting in it, talking earnestly. The men had heard the crash of the cupboard in the cellar, and they saw the boys run away from the mill and across the field. The men waited only a second or two, then two of them got out of the car and ran back inside, whilst the third man turned the car and drove it carefully along the track until it was as close as possible to the mill. Then he too got out, and leaving the car door open, hurried into the mill. Chapter 8. The Boat House Within an hour, Paul and Midge were back at the mill with Constable Harris. Luckily for the boys, Paul's dad had been in the office when they arrived at the house. He had been especially interested in the printing press. Paul didn't mention exactly what he thought they were printing. There'd be trouble if he was wrong. Can't leave the station just now, his dad had said. Constable Harris will go with you. Harris? he called. Check out Kelly's mill and report back to me. So the boys and the large constable had arrived at the mill in the little police van. Midge led the way round to the little shrub-hidden door and into the dim building. The smell of the chemicals met them as they opened the squeaking door. Phew! That's the chemical, all right, Constable Harris agreed. Let's get this over with before we're all gassed. They crossed the floor, pulled up the trap door, and cautiously felt their way down the steep steps to the cellar. Broken, he said. It was working, exclaimed Paul. Never mind, it's not important, Constable Harris said, and he switched on his own torch and shone the powerful beam round the cellar. It's gone! Both boys gasped. The heavy table in the centre of the cellar was quite empty. The surface was scarred and stained, but there was nothing on it. No machinery, no press, not even a scrap of paper. Everything else looked much the same. The cupboard with its broken door was still there, the boxes, tins, rubbish and junk all over the floor, but no printing press. You sure it was here? You're not pulling my leg? Constable Harris asked, looking accusingly at the boys. Certain, said Paul. It was here on the table. He pointed to the exact spot. Midge rubbed his nose with concentration. It couldn't have just disappeared. It was too big to move, he said. Paul frowned. Well, not really, he said doubtfully. It can't have been that heavy. After all, someone got it down here in the first place. I don't suppose it weighed much more than a sack of potatoes. Constable Harris circled the table slowly, flashing his torch about as he went. What's this? he asked as the light beam picked out a big piece of machinery on the floor at the back of the table. Ah, a generator, he said as he bent down stiffly to peer closely at it. Yes, a new portable generator. These are quite common on the farms round here, in case of power cuts. We couldn't see that from the cupboard, Paul told him. Constable Harris stood up. Are you sure this isn't the machinery you saw, he said. Definitely, said Paul. We saw a printing press. Constable Harris took out his two-way radio and began to speak rapidly into it. The boys kicked through the clutter on the stone floor. Midge found the bolt from the cupboard door, still fastened to a chunk of rotten wood. Then he picked up a large tin, shook it and sniffed at it. This is the chemical, he said. These tins must be full of it. He turned over some of the tumbled tins with his foot. What should we do with them? 
He held the tin up to show Constable Harris, who was still speaking on the radio. At last he put his radio away. A tin? Oh, yes. He sounded vague. A chemical. We'll take a tin along with us when we leave. I'll just have a last look round. Make sure I haven't missed anything. He shone the torch round the cellar again, over the damp, cobweb-hung ceiling and walls and hanging lamp flex. A broken bulb swung at the end of the long wire. That's why it wouldn't come on, said Paul. Must have been smashed by whoever took the press up the steps. The torch beam crossed the cobbled floor again. There were yellow and brown stains between some of the stones, and little oily puddles lodged in tiny pools in the uneven floor. In a little pile close to the generator, the beam picked up some thin slivers of paper. Constable Harris picked them up and looked at them closely. Know what these are? he asked. But the boys shook their heads. No, said Paul. Constable Harris put the pieces of paper carefully in his notebook. Trimmings of paper, he muttered. Right, lads, he said briskly. You leave this to me now. There are one or two things I'll have to check up on. You make yourself scarce. Off you go. The boys stared at each other in amazement. They were being dismissed after all they had discovered. What do you make of the papers? Paul asked. Could they... Off with you, Constable Harris interrupted impatiently. It's police work from now on. Nothing more you can do except keep out of the way. Come on, Paul, Midge said, and he led the way to the steps. He held up the heavy tin of chemicals. What shall I do with this? he asked and he shook the fluid till it sloshed in the tin. The policeman looked irritated. Oh, put it down by the van as you leave, he said. Then he switched on his radio and began to talk rapidly to Sergeant Oates back in the office. The boys left the cellar, put the tin on the ground by the police van, and ambled along the mill track, kicking pebbles as they went. They reached the main road, and Midge exploded. Typical, isn't it? We find the chemicals, we see some blokes acting suspiciously in the mill, we see them using the press, we report it, and now it's leave it to us boys, be off. Harris is always like that, Paul explained, but he usually has much more to say. That has to shut him up sometimes. They walked on in silence till they had almost reached the village. Then Midge stopped. What I'd like to know is what were those men doing with a printing press out there at the mill? And why did they move it? It was only a printing press. No one would bother about it, unless it was stolen. Or they were printing something illegal, like... Paul began. Midge laughed. Labels aren't illegal. No, but banknotes are, Paul replied quietly. Midge stared at Paul his eyes nearly popping out of his head. Banknotes? Do you mean they're forgers? I think so. I'm not certain, though, said Paul carefully. Phew, Midge whistled. What a laugh! Forgers using Wally Kelly's old mill forge! <laughs> the boys hurried into the village. Paul glanced anxiously at the sky. A chill wind had piled big, lumpy, grey clouds up in front of the afternoon sun, and it was quite cold by the time the boys reached the main street. At the end of the back lane behind the police station, Paul stopped. The station half of the house would be busy with his dad and the French police, and his grandfather would be in the kitchen, and he'd expect some work to be done on the garden. We'd better go to your place, he said. Midge agreed without question. Right. Quick, before it rains, he said. He led the way through the twisty, narrow streets to his home, the old square Victorian house, now a private hotel in its own heavily wooded grounds. The wind's moaning rose to a scream as they reached the grey building. Going to be a storm soon, said Midge as they hurried up the drive. They skirted the busy front door and rushed round to the back, the kitchen door was open, and hot smells drifting out reminded both boys they had missed lunch. 
Wait here, Midge ordered, and he disappeared into the kitchen. Paul waited obediently, listening to the clattering pots, aimless whistling, and sizzling sounds that wafted through the doorway. Midge reappeared a few minutes later, carrying two large red apples, an interesting-looking bag, and a big bottle of Coke. He grinned impishly. We'll take these down to the boathouse. No one will disturb us there, he said. Thought the gardener used it, said Paul. Midge grinned. Not him. He's too busy nursing his tomatoes. They hurried across the lawn, past the tennis courts, through the bushes, along a narrow, almost overgrown path, past thick, earthy-smelling bushes and wind-blasted trees. At last they came out onto the edge of a small, stony beach. Tucked into the rocky, overhanging cliffs and well above the high water mark stood a small, old grey building, the boathouse. The boys ran across the pebbles to it. Midge aimed a hefty kick at the worn place at the bottom of the battered door. Then he put his shoulder to it and pushed. With a reluctant creak, it scraped open, letting out a gust of musty air. The boys slipped inside, leaving the door open to let in light. The little boathouse was a great place for a hideout. During the winter, when it was too cold to meet at the stream, they used the building as a den. Why doesn't your dad keep your new boat in here? asked Paul. Loazo's too big, said Midge. Anyhow, there isn't room in here for anything else. Paul looked round and had to agree. Nets, sacks, boxes, lobster pots and ropes filled the place. The centre of the floor was almost completely filled by a very old upturned dinghy with a huge gash running all along one side. It had been there for as long as Paul and Midge could remember. It was now covered with a piece of old, torn green tarpaulin. No one had been there since the winter. The boys sat on the dinghy, and Midge handed Paul an apple. Then he shared the contents of the bag, crisps, two hot sausage rolls, and some biscuits between them. They munched and took turns to drink the coke in contented silence. Chapter 9 Where's the Greek? Those men at the mill, Midge said as he wiped his sticky fingers on his jeans. You really think they were forgers, making their own banknotes? Paul nodded. His mouth was too full to speak. Five pound or ten pound notes? Which do you think? Midge mused. Or even twenty pound notes? Paul screwed up his eyes and tried to visualise the small pieces of paper the man had held up in the cellar. Don't think they were English at all, he said slowly. They had a funny pattern on them, and the colour was different. Sort of yellowish-brown, like the stains on the floor of the mill. He paused. I wonder if it's got anything to do with the French police seeing Dad. What do French banknotes look like? asked Midge. Paul shook his head. Dunno. Midge jumped up in excitement. I bet Harris and your dad are up at the mill all day, lying in wait for those blokes when they go back there with their press. They'll creep in the mill, then your dad will nab them. Daft, said Paul. Those men won't go back to the mill. They know they've been seen, so they'll scarper, if they haven't already. I should think they're miles away by now, with the press in the back of their old car. They'll just stop printing again, somewhere else that's quiet and out of the way like Kelly's mill. Midge flopped down on the old boat, his face a picture of disappointment. He drank deeply from the Coke bottle, then passed it to Paul. Here, you finish it, he said gloomily. Paul drained the fizzy Coke quickly and tossed back the empty plastic bottle. But Midge wasn't looking, so he missed it. The bottle flew past him and dropped through the gaping hole in the side of the ancient dinghy. Butterfingers, mocked Paul. Midge grinned and reached down into the hole. Suddenly his face changed as his fingers touched something soft. He peered anxiously into the dark hole and sniffed. Paul, he exclaimed. Quick, here, look. Paul leaned over the hole. What? he asked. Sniff, Midge ordered. Here, down under the boat. Paul sniffed like a dog following an especially juicy trail. 
The chemical from the mill. What's it doing here? he asked. Midge reached down into the boat. He picked out the Coke bottle and tossed it aside. Then he reached in the hole again, and his fingers touched the soft material that had startled him before. It was some sort of cloth. Midge sniffed his fingers. Phew, he said. It's on this cloth. Let's look properly. Help me turn the boat over. Together the boys heaved the rotten dinghy over onto its side. The dust rose in great whirling clouds, making both boys cough as they dropped the boat with a crunch onto the pebbly ground. Underneath was a large... Yeah, we need to get as good as mine, he said. Midge bent down and tried to lift the machine, but it was too heavy. He only managed to move it a few inches. He sat back on his heels. Paul stared round the cluttered boathouse. Who knows about this place? he asked. Midge thought for some seconds. Well, Dad and the gardener, Tom, you and me. I suppose lots of people from the village, but I can't imagine any of them being mixed up in forgery. Paul got up and went to the door. How do you think they got the press down here? It's pretty heavy. He scanned the rocky bay and pounding waves. I suppose a boat could have come in, and if there were three men, they might have managed to lift it quite easily. They couldn't have used the path that had been seen from the house. Midge nodded. They'd still have to know this place. The bay's fairly private, with the rocks at the entrance. They could have used a small car. There's a sort of path back there amongst the rocks. It leads to the main hotel drive. It's not been used for years, not since we came to live here anyway. It's fairly overgrown, but I should think a small car or van might do it. He joined Paul at the doorway. No one uses it except Dad to walk the dog. What about the visitors? Couldn't they find the path and this boathouse? asked Paul. Midge laughed out loud. Can't see any of the old dears lugging a printing press around. The hotel specialises in old age pensioners' holidays. They're all doddery and a bit dotty. They go everywhere by car or coach, and they never walk, not even down to the main road. Suddenly Paul dashed back into the boathouse and began to search through the green tarpaulin under boxes and nets, and in amongst the fish boxes. Midge joined him, moving lobster pots and peering into dark corners. Hey, what are we looking for? he asked after some minutes. The plates, Paul explained. Then, seeing the blank look on Midge's face, the printing plates, you know, they used to print each side of the notes. I bet the men have taken them away. He pulled aside a stack of blue fish boxes, all glittery with fish scales. Hey, look at this, he said, and he pulled out a long cylinder. It was yellow with a black rubber end and shiny connecting pieces. Paul put it down, and it clanged with a hollow metal ring. Wait, that's what we heard in the mill, gasped Midge. He bent and read the black lettering on the side of the cylinder. Aqualung 1707. It's an air cylinder. The one at the mill was an air cylinder too. The men were filling it with the banknotes, said Paul. Then he frowned. This one's a bit different. There were no connecting bits on the top of the one at the mill. He tried to unscrew the black rubber end of the cylinder, but it wouldn't move at all. The black rubber seemed to be only a protective cap for the bottom end. This looks like a proper cylinder for skin divers to use. I think the other was a copy. Does your dad go skin diving? No, said Midge quietly. But the mad Greek does. Remember, we saw him. Paul frowned. Yes, but I thought you told me he didn't like the sea. He was in the boat when we went out on the night adventure. He'd been out diving then. A cylinder turned up at the mill. And now we've found this, and there's the car. I reckon the Greek is mixed up with the forgers. 
Let's see where he is and what he's doing now. And he dashed out of the little boathouse. Wait, called Paul, but it was too late. Midge was already on his way across the spray-blown rocks. We'll take this path, he called, pointing to a little gap in the rocks. There, Paul saw a track that led off into the nearby trees, only a few metres from the boathouse door. Paul bent down and peered at the soft sand. Midge, look, tyre tracks! You are right. They must have brought the press down here in their car, he said. We'll check the Greek then, said Midge. Come on. So, shielding their faces from the whippy twigs, they hurried along the track and up to the hotel. The entrance hall was quite empty, except for the blonde secretary who was frantically typing in the cramped little office. Midge went up and tapped on the little glass door and flashed her one of his best smiles. Molly, is the mad Greek in? he asked. Molly Page went on typing. Now, Michael, you really shouldn't talk about the visitors like that. You know what your father would say? You call him that, said Midge with a grin. Oh, come on. You know very well no one can get round his name. Well, is he in? Molly sighed. No idea. He doesn't come in for meals. He could be anywhere. Now let me get on with these letters before the last post goes. She reached for another pile of papers and attacked the typewriter with vigour. Paul was chuckling to himself as Molly's red fingernails flew over the typewriter keys, like ten frantic ladybirds, he thought. Midge nudged him. Come on, this way, let's look for ourselves. He led the way up the wide main staircase two steps at a time, then along a narrow creaking corridor. At the end, he stopped and pointed to a door. Number 18. This is his, he said. You're not just going to knock, Paul gasped. Whatever would his friend do next? Midge grinned and nodded. Of course. And he tapped politely on the white door. I'll ask him if he wants to order a Sunday paper, he said. But there was no reply from within. After a second tap and wait, Midge tried the handle without success. Locked, he muttered. Never mind, wait here. He dashed down the corridor and returned a couple of seconds later carrying a bunch of keys. Chambermaid's master keys, he announced. And in no time the door of number 18 was open. Paul and Midge hurried into the room. The bedroom was very ordinary, just like all hotel bedrooms. Neat, tidy, and very empty. Midge hurried to the chest of drawers. You check the wardrobe, he ordered quietly. Paul obediently pulled open the wardrobe door. Empty, he said, as the bare wire hangers rattled. These two, added Midge. He's gone, skipped. He crossed to the bed and pulled back the green coverlet, then the duvet and the pillows. No pyjamas. He's gone all right. That's going to go spare. The boys stared around the room, but there was nothing there to give them a clue as to where the Greek had gone or what he had been doing. Suddenly, something on the floor under the wash basin caught Paul's eye. It looked like a screwed up ball of dark paper. Got something, he said. He picked it up and held it out to Midge. A black sock. Phew! Smell it! he gasped. Midge scowled. You must be joking, he said, backing away and holding his nose. But Paul waved the black sock under his friend's nose. It's the chemicals again. The Greek is mixed up in this forgery business. The boys looked at each other over the offending sock. Neither said a word. Neither knew what to do next. The silence of the room was shattered as rain suddenly rattled against the window and the wind screamed through the gaps in the old frames. What do we do now? Midge asked. But before Paul could answer, the door was flung open. The boys stared in astonishment. Chapter 10 Dad! Dad! There stood Sergeant Oates, almost filling the open doorway, surprise written all over his face. 
What the hell? He gasped. Molly pushed past him and stormed over to the boys. What do you think you're doing in here? She shouted, her eyes flashing with anger. Constable Harris, puffing and blowing after rushing up the hotel stairs, came into the room and almost collided with the angry Molly. The boys stood silent as he quickly began to search the room, opening bare cupboards and peering into empty drawers. Paul's father glared at the stunned boys. Well, he said after a long pause. What have you to say for yourselves? But the boys said nothing. Paul, you've certainly no right to be here, he said. Neither has young Michael, Molly exploded. Mr. Theod the, the Dot, she spluttered, the, the Greek gentleman, such a nice man. He'll be furious when he hears you've been going through his things. No, he won't, said Midge, as his courage returned. He's gone. Molly's mouth dropped open. Midge went on. You know, gone. Hopped it. Scarpered. And just how do you know that? Sergeant Oates asked. Midge glanced quickly at Molly. We checked. All his stuff's gone. Everything. Even his pyjamas. Oh, yes. Everything except that. He pointed to the sock in Paul's hand. Paul held the crumpled sock out at arm's length. Smell this, Dad, he said. It's the same as the chemical in the mill. His voice trailed off under his father's stern gaze. Sergeant Oates took the sock in a gloved hand. He sniffed it quickly and passed it to Constable Harris. Get that checked at the station. Constable Harris dropped the smelly sock into a small plastic bag and sealed it. It could confirm our suspicions about the connections between the Greek and the French counterfeiters, Sergeant Oates said quietly. Counterfeiters, said Midge excitedly. They really are forgers. You're right, Paul. Is it foreign money, he asked. French, suggested Paul quietly. Correct. Constable Harris sounded surprised. French 100 franc notes. Very good counterfeits, too. They... But Sergeant Oates interrupted. That's enough, Harris. Wait, you two. Anything in the cupboards? All empty, as the boys said, sir, Constable Harris replied, and he went to the door. But Molly blocked the way. Here, before you go, has he really gone? She demanded. It appears so, Constable Harris replied after a glance at Sergeant Oates. Without paying, Molly exclaimed. My, you'd never expect it from such a nice gentleman. Dad, Paul burst out. He was dying to tell him about their find in the boathouse. With... Be quiet, Sergeant Oates snapped. I'll have words with both of you later. Then to Molly. Nice gentleman, you said. She nodded. Truth to say, we didn't see very much of him. Out nearly all day. Kept to himself. You know, quiet. Sergeant Oates nodded. Quiet was something Molly was not. Do you happen to know what he did during the day? Molly shook her head. Went walking, I expect. Funny thing, though. We know, Midge began. You again, shouted Sergeant Oates. Paul thought his dad would explode. I told you to, but Midge interrupted. He went skin-diving, he said quickly. We saw him. Midge, he didn't do any skin-diving, Paul said. Midge stared at his friend. What do you mean, he asked. Sergeant Oates raised an eyebrow. And just what do you think you're talking about? Midge stared at his feet and began hesitatingly. We, well, we saw the Greek at the harbour one night. Then, glancing at Paul, he went on to tell the two astonished policemen about their night adventure. They listened without a word. Sergeant Oates didn't even glance in Paul's direction till Midge had finished. The Greek was wearing ordinary clothes, Paul added. I suppose he could have been fishing, but not skin diving or swimming. That is, unless... Oh, I could have told you he doesn't swim, said Molly. He told me the very first day here that he hated the sea.
said it bothered him, and that he couldn't swim. I couldn't see why he had come to Port Santon. After all, there's nothing much else here, is there? Sergeant Oates nodded slowly. Right now, we'll check the boat. Midge, where does your father keep it? In the marina? Wait, Dad, Paul urged. We've been trying to tell you. Well, Sergeant Oates sighed. Be quick. We found the printing press, Paul said triumphantly. Both policemen stood rooted to the spot, staring at Paul in amazement. You what? Sergeant Oates gasped. The printing press from the mill, said Midge. We found it in our boathouse. He paused, suddenly nervous under the cold stare of both men. We did try to tell you, he added. Sergeant Oates nodded thoughtfully. Right then, what are we waiting for? Let's see this boathouse of yours. They hurried from the hotel down the path, through the trees to the beach. The bushes dripped water on them as they passed. The two policemen went straight into the little building and glanced briefly round the cluttered place. Then they inspected the printing press and the air cylinder. This could be the way they did it, said Constable Harris. And that's certainly their press. Midge turned to Paul. We told him that, he hissed. Sergeant Oates looked from the press to the boys. No sign of the plates, I suppose. You found everything else and solved our case for us. Midge and Paul shook their heads. The policemen finished their search, then made for the door. Nothing more here, said Sergeant Oates. Paul, you said you saw an air cylinder like this at the mill. Paul nodded. Not exactly like that. The one in the mill unscrewed somehow, and this has connecting pieces on it. Theo Watsit was carrying one too, when we saw him at night, Midge added. Right, we'll check the boat now, said Sergeant Oates. Just at that moment, a brilliant flash of lightning and a roll of thunder startled them all, and more big drops of rain began to fall. This time the storm had really broken. They all raced back to the hotel and climbed quickly into the police car. The harbour, Harris, Sergeant Oates ordered. We'll check the boat, then take it from there. They drove rapidly down the drive and along the narrow lane towards Port Santon seafront. Heavy thunderclouds and sweeping rain made it almost dark as night as the car swished through the puddles and flooded gutters. As they neared the harbour, they were suddenly met head-on by a tide of people, bikes and pushchairs. The police car had to almost stop as crowds of wet, dishevelled visitors spilled from the beach and promenade, dashing for shelter from the wind and driving rain. When the car eventually reached the harbour, the place was deserted. Great spouts of spray from the pounding waves flopped over the harbour wall and dropped onto the road and the car itself. Constable Harris stopped the car, and they stared through the streaming windows at the marina. It was quite a sight. Little boats were tugging frantically at their moorings, trying to escape the storm. The noise was terrific as the wind screamed through the masts and rigging of the yachts. Where's this boat? Sergeant Oates asked. He opened the window to get a better view. The rain and wind gushed into the car. Midge pointed to a large red boy. It was empty. That's where it should be, he exclaimed. They all stared at the empty boy. Suddenly Paul had an idea. The harbour master, he cried, pointing to a tall building close by. He must have seen where it went. Constable Harris left the car and, crouching low against the rain, he dashed across the road to the house with the upstairs office overlooking the harbour. He returned a few minutes later and scrambled into the front seat. Three men took the edgy's boat out about half an hour ago, he gasped, mopping the rain from his face with a large handkerchief. He says, Sam Crane, a local fisherman, warned them that the weather was going to blow up, but they said they were only going to be a little while. Skin diving, they said. He says they had no diving equipment with them in the boat that he could see except a, a couple of cylinders. He thought it was a bit odd. Anyway, there's a flap on now, 
He's received an emergency message. A small boat seems to be in difficulties. It sent up red distress flares some miles south of here. Is it Loiseau? Midge asked anxiously. Very possibly. No other boats have been reported as being out. The helicopter's going to search the area, and the lifeboat... They didn't hear what else Constable Harris said. For just then, there was a hiss and a swish, and a rocket shot into the stormy sky, and exploded into stars with a loud bang. Chapter 11 The Lifeboat The Lifeboat Maroon! cried Paul. Sergeant Oates spoke rapidly on the radio. Then he and Constable Harris left the car. You two get off home, he ordered. There's nothing you can do here. Oh, Dad, Paul groaned, but the policeman had disappeared into the lifeboat house. I'm not going to miss all the fun, exclaimed Paul. Nor me, agreed Midge. They both climbed out of the car, ducking away from the rain and spray as a number of cars screeched up. Doors flew open and figures came running into the lifeboat house, throwing off jerseys and jackets as they ran. Paul and Midge slipped inside the doorway and stood in the shadows by the souvenir stand. Everyone was so busy that no one took any notice of the two watching boys. Some men were struggling into their cumbersome orange oilskins. Others were already hurrying to their posts on the tipped boat. And more, older men who had been on the lifeboat in their younger days were still arriving all ready to help. Paul nudged Midge. Grandfather, he hissed. His grandfather rushed past the boys and went straight to the radio shack. What's he doing here? asked Midge in astonishment. He used to be in the crew years ago. He still comes and takes a turn at the radio. Paul watched his dad struggle into oilskins, then climb up the ladder into the lifeboat. All here, Cox, came a shout. There was another shout. Right, Cox! The launcher struck the metal pin and the lifeboat began to move. It shot down the short, steep slipway in a haze of glittering paint chips. Then it almost disappeared in a cloud of spray. The engines roared and the lifeboat was away into the darkness. Paul and Midge watched the boat go. Then they joined the group of watching fishermen, helpers and interested bystanders at the radio room. Constable Harris pushed through the crowd and made for the door. He stopped when he saw the boys. What are you doing here? he demanded. Off home with you now. There's nothing you can do here. Oh, please, Midge pleaded. Paul turned to his grandfather. Please, Gramps, let us stay with you. The old man grinned and nodded. All right, Paul, go on then. I can keep an eye on you here. But you'd better go home, Midge. Midge frowned. I'd much rather stay here, he said. Constable Harris glanced at the old man. They exchanged knowing nods, and Constable Harris turned to go. I'll phone the edges. Tell them where you are, he said. Then he left the lifeboat house and went into the streaming rain. Don't get in the way, you two, Paul's grandfather warned. He handed the boys a jar of instant coffee and pointed to an electric kettle and some mugs on a tray in the corner. Here, make yourselves useful, he said. So for the next hour or so, Midge and Paul were kept busy making countless mugs of coffee for the men on duty by the radio, then washing the mugs and making more coffee. Any news? Midge asked hopefully when they had a chance to speak. Paul's grandfather shook his head. Not yet. Plenty of time. They will be all right, won't they? Paul asked as the radio crackled into life again. The sea sounded wilder than ever pounding against the nearby harbour wall. Not to worry, said the cheery coast guard. The lifeboat's been out in weather much worse than this. They'll be fine. Our only worry is the other boat. And his face creased into tiny lines of concern. Suddenly the radio crackled and the lifeboat Cox's voice came through quite clearly. Port Santon, Port Santon, lifeboat calling. Weather worsening, repeat worsening. Helicopter returning to base. No sign of missing boat. Continuing search. Out. More coffee, Paul, his grandfather ordered. It's going to be a very long night. Hours later, it was quite dark, and the lifeboat had still not returned. The thunder and lightning was long past, but the storm was still battering the lifeboat house. 
and screaming in the radio wires, and above all, the constant pounding of the waves filled the air. Inside the radio room, it was warm, stuffy, and cosily safe. Paul and Midge had lost count of the number of mugs of coffee they had made. They sat together on a narrow bench in the small room, their eyes closed in the drowsy warmth. Suddenly the peace was shattered as a gust of cold air swept through the lifeboat house. Constable Harris came stumbling in. He slammed the door to behind him. Any news? he asked. The men in the room merely shook their heads. The harbour master rubbed his stubbly chin and checked the clock over the radio. Nothing this last half hour or so. They're still searching. Helicopter had to give up when the light went. Paul hurriedly handed the policeman a steaming mug of coffee, and the radio crackled into life again for the umpteenth time. Port Santon, Port Santon, lifeboat calling, lifeboat calling. Motorboat has been located and has sunk. Repeat, sunk. I'm returning to port with survivors, all safe. Paul and Midge jumped up with excitement and relief. They've got them! Great! Good old Dad! Paul yelled. A little over an hour later, the lifeboat arrived back in the harbour and the boys joined a large crowd, amazingly large for such a late hour, that had gathered on the cobbled harbour in the rain to watch the returning lifeboat. Ropes were thrown and caught, the boat tied up securely. Then the men climbed wearily ashore. Paul's father, still in his orange oilskins, was one of the first off the boat. He came slowly up the steps, carrying two heavy yellow and black air cylinders. Behind him came the rest of the crew, leading three bedraggled men wrapped in orange blankets. Even in the dim light from the single harbour light, the boys could see the men were all pale, ashen-faced and wet. And the tallest man had his arm in a sling. There's the Greek, Midge exclaimed. Wonder what he's done to himself. The men were hustled quickly into the waiting police car. Sergeant Oates climbed stiffly into the front seat. You got them, Dad! shouted Paul. Sergeant Oates glanced round wearily. You two should be at home, he said. Then he grinned. Bed. I'll tell you all about it in the morning. The boys stood back and watched the car drive away. They didn't hear Paul's grandfather come up behind them. You'd better spend what's left of the night at our place, he said to Midge. Come on, your family know you're with me. I wonder what the Greek's done with the money, Midge asked as they walked slowly back to the police station. And the plates, added Paul. You'll find out all in good time, said Paul's grandfather. Right now, I'm ready for some cocoa. I've had enough coffee to sink a ship. Chapter 12. All Solved It wasn't until much later the next day that Paul and Midge heard what had happened out in the storm. There had been great comings and goings in the police station, so the boys had spent the morning making half-hearted attempts to clear out the back garden, whilst they hung around waiting for Paul's dad to come out of his office. At last, when they were all eating a very late lunch, Paul just couldn't wait any longer. Dad, please, he burst out, tell us what happened last night. Sergeant Oates pushed his empty plate away and leaned back in his chair. All right, he said, grinning broadly. You certainly deserve an explanation. After all, if it hadn't been for you two boys and the storm, we'd never have caught those forgers. They'd have slipped clean away. But you were on to them, said Paul. Oh, yes, but only just, Sergeant Oates said. You see, the French police warned us to watch out for a gang of forgers who had flooded the casinos of southern France with counterfeit 100-franc notes. The police knew they were being printed somewhere in England, but not the exact location. Nor did they know how they were getting into France, even with extra customs officers on patrol. You supplied the answer there. The boys felt embarrassed. Go on, Dad, urged Paul. Well, as you found out, he said, the notes were printed here in Kelly's Mill, packed into a false air cylinder, then taken out and handed over to another boat out in the channel. When the second boat landed in a quiet bay, or even in a main harbour, right under the noses of the customs men, no one would dream of checking their equipment. After all, they'd been seen taking it out. No one suspected a swap out at sea. 
Sergeant Oates paused to pour himself another cup of coffee. You said the storm helped, said Midge. How? The rough sea swamped the boat engine, Sergeant Oates continued. The men did their best to repair it, and that's when the Greek was injured. He bruised his wrist, wrenching at the engine. He stirred his coffee thoughtfully. Pity we didn't get the plates, though. What could the men do with them? asked Midge. Start up somewhere else, said Sergeant Oates. They might have dropped them overboard before we caught up with them, but I doubt it. They most likely passed them on to a contact, perhaps even before they went out in the boat. Or, he paused again thoughtfully, they could have hidden them somewhere handy, ready to collect another day. Suddenly, Paul sat up with an excited expression on his face. I knew there was something missing, he cried. The others stared at Paul. Dad, were there any suitcases in Midge's boat? he asked. The sergeant thought, then slowly shook his head. Only air cylinders, nothing else at all. Could they have sunk with the boat? Paul pressed on. Again the sergeant shook his head. No. Luckily the boat didn't sink until we were getting the last man off. What's your idea? The Greek's luggage! That's what! Paul almost shouted. He'd been staying at the hotel for some time, and the room was empty, so he must have dumped it somewhere. The plates could be in the cases, wrapped in his pyjamas. Sergeant Oates stood up. Right, Paul. And they'd planned to come back from their little trip, pick up the cases, and move on up the coast and start printing again. He reached to the phone. They'd have no press, though, said Midge. That's no problem. They're easy enough to pick up, said Sergeant Oates. He dialed a number. We'll go back and check the boathouse again, Midge. Paul thought for some seconds. No, Dad. I think I know where they could be. Midge stared at Paul, wondering what he was going to say next. The car, said Paul. Of course, said Midge. The car with the rickety number plate. I bet that's where the cases are. Let's see if we can find it. I think it may be in the harbour car park, said Paul. After all, the men didn't know we were so close to catching them. Let's look. They all rushed down to the harbour car park. And there it was. The battered black car was parked under the trees at the far end of the car park. Constable Harris forced the rusty door open. On the back seat was a tartan rug. Sergeant Oates pulled it aside, and there was a small brown suitcase. Theodopolis hadn't expected to be caught so soon, he said, as he tried the locks on the case. It opened easily. Constable Harris checked the case, quickly running his hands through the clothes. He stood back after a few minutes and shook his head. Nothing here, sir, he said. But there must be, said Paul anxiously, peering at the clothes. They've just got to be here. Sergeant Oates was peering at the inside of the car, looking into the glove pockets and any small hiding places, and feeling down the side of the seats. He bent and reached under the front seat, and drew out a parcel wrapped in brown paper. He opened it quickly, and out slipped two slim sheets of metal. Well done, said Constable Harris. The plates! They all sat down on the car park wall in the sunshine, and stared at the shiny sheets of metal covered with scrolly lines and squiggles. Well, that's the whole mystery cleared up, said Sergeant Oates. The forger's caught, the plates found, and the mill... Oh, yes, with all the excitement of the lifeboat, I quite forgot to tell you. The fire brigade are going to swill the mill building out tomorrow. That will get rid of the chemicals. In a few weeks' time, the stream will be back to normal. Then, maybe, he grinned at the boys, I'll get a chance to go fishing with you. When you finish the back garden. The boys groaned. Tell you what, Midge grinned impishly. How about nipping out to the cemetery tonight, Paul? You know, a night adventure. He backed away. Paul leapt up and chased his friend. You're joking, he yelled. Never again!
That was The Secret of Kelly's Mill by Zena Karras. Read by Nigel Greaves.